a lot of these problems that we have can begin to be dealt with. The waste problems, the CO2 problems, there are ways to address this that are not just hypothetical anymore. They can really be done and there's companies starting around this. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, clean tech energy advances. Um, tell you about our work on flash graphene and, and more flash, and then uh, also trapping carbon dioxide on plastic waste. So we discovered a, a process in, in uh, August of 2018, and uh, so this, is, this has come along quite rapidly in my group, and we found that we could take any carbon material, any carbon material, and the vast majority of what human beings deal with, what we eat, what we're made out of, what we, what's around us, most of the trash we throw out from our house is, is carbon-based. Any carbon material between two electrodes, we put a voltage and a current through it, turns into graphene. Graphene is this amazing material that, that, that uh, can strengthen things and, and uh, uh, it breaks every carbon bond in there and it reconstructs as the thermodynamically most stable system, which is graphene. Uh, depending on the sample size is what depends on the voltage and the current, and there's a big burst of light, hence we call it the flash graphene process, because it, it puts out the, the black body radiation. Uh, uh, I don't want to say radiation in this audience, you're going to get the wrong idea, just light, it puts out light, nothing radioactive. And, uh, um, so what we've done is we've been able to take lots of different carbon sources, carbon black, anthracite coal, calcined coke, even food, coffee, for example, and we can turn it into graphene. Coffee is 40% ca carbon, C6H12O6, it is a carbohydrate, and we can get 35 out of that 40% carbon turned into graphene. What's amazing is our electrical cost is 30 to $35 per ton. That's all we have to put in. There's no solvent, there's no water, it's just electricity, and about 30 to $35 per ton. And I know most of us don't buy things on the scale of tons, so what does that mean? High density polyethylene, which is what makes up a lot of the plastic bottles that, that, that you have. Uh, high density polyethylene is, is uh, about $2,000 a ton. So it gives you, gives you a, this is really inexpensive, and graphene is going into all sorts of materials. And what forms in this is what's called turbostratic graphene, which is disordered graphene as opposed to ordered. Because when you have, when you, the way graphene is, is sold right now is you take graphite, the natural mineral graphite, and you put it under lots of shearing environment and ultrasonication, and you get these stacks called graphene nanoplatelets that stick together really well, very hard to pull them apart. But this forms so quickly, the entire flash process is done in about 10 milliseconds. The temperature rises to about 3,300 Kelvin in, in, uh, in five milliseconds, 10 to the fifth degrees C per second, and then falls at 10 to the fourth degrees C per second. The outer housing of, the, of, of that system is just warm to the touch. All the energy goes into the material. We're not heating a furnace. Totally different technology. We're put, driving all the energy right into the molecules. And uh, it doesn't have time to stack and order, so now it forms, it, it disperses in, into composites much more easily. Because for a composite, to have a good nanocomposite, you have to have two things. You have to have good dispersion, where it mixes well, you have to have good interfacial interaction, interaction between the nanomaterial and the host. Uh, we can, we can uh, uh, if we look at commercial graphene versus our graphene, you take the commercial graphene, you take it up in, in a solvent like water with a surfactant. If you spin the thing down, you put it, a, 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 it'll all fall out and it'll be clear. Not our material, it's really well dispersed. We put it in plastics, it strengthens tremendously the plastic. We put it in cement or concrete, we get 35% increase in the compressive strength of cement. Uh, and, and, uh, um, uh, and, and then we get a 20% increase in the tensile strength. Cement and concrete are 8% of all worldwide CO2 emissions. Now, if you don't think that CO2 is a problem, it doesn't matter anymore. What we feel doesn't matter anymore. It is a political football and we have to deal with it. And we're gonna be confronted with this. So, so uh, 
to be able to take something that is 8% of the CO2 emissions and use one third less, if you could use one third less concrete, that would be a tremendous advance. And uh, this is, this is a, a little automated system that we built. We actually built this during the, the COVID shutdown. We were shut out of our labs for two and a half months. So I bought a bunch of 3D printers as they told us we were gonna be shut out of the labs. You can buy these 3D printers for like $600. I bought a bunch of them, sent them home with the students. Electrochemistry, sent them home with the students. I mean, they're doing chemistry in their garages, in their kitchens. And, and this was designed and built during COVID where where this graphene comes in, drops in in these, and then, and then uh, uh, you flash it. And uh, um, so we built the automated system and we delivered to the Department of Energy. Uh, this uh, five months early, we delivered it. So you've heard of Moore's Law. We talked a lot about this today. This we call Dewey's Law because Dewey is my student who came up with this process. I didn't think of it. It's one of my students. Most of the advances in my lab, the students come up with. And uh, this during the COVID closure. So what is our rate of growth of scaling the system? We're doubling production rate every nine weeks. We double the production of flash graphene every nine weeks. We double its production. So much so that, that uh, I'll show you where we are corporately uh, going toward that. Now, what are the advantages of flash graphene? Graphene is non-toxic. It's even used in several medical, can be used in medical applications. It's naturally occurring in the environment. It's, it's agglomerates or the natural mineral graphite. If you have graphite in riverbeds, there's sheets of graphene being, being spewn out. So this has been in, in, in our world for a long time. It's a terminal natural sink for carbon because microbial decomposition is very slow. If you turn carbon into graphene, it doesn't enter the CO2 cycle again. The vast majority of what we bring up from under the ground, whether it's oil, or gas, or coal, it's gonna end up in the CO2 cycle eventually. If we combust it, it ends up very quickly. If we turn it into other products, then what happens is when we end up throwing those out, those end up being taken up by plants, the plants die, it's gonna enter the CO2 cycle again. Not here, it's a terminal natural sink for carbon dioxide. It can be used in composites of all types, plastics and uh, all sorts of hosts, uh, can, it can be used and it strengthens it. You just add a little bit of this, you get enormous strength increases. That 30%, 35% increase in the compressive strength, that was with 0.1 weight percent in the cement. Uh, the flash process requires no solvent, no water, no purification because all the non-carbon elements come subliming out. Uh, it, because carbon doesn't sublime until about 3,800 Kelvin. Uh, the electrical flashing cost is estimated 30 to $35 per metric ton. And you say, you, you, you wonder, would that really scale? It actually is getting better as we're scaling it up. Uh, at the current price of graphene is right now $60,000 to $200,000 per ton. You want to compare those two numbers? Look at that. I mean, so it, it's, it's, there's just a big demand for this material. In fact, if you own a Ford, Ford cars have had graphene in them since February 2020. Every Ford vehicle has graphene in the foam cushion seats and the underhood insulation and lots more moving in because it, 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 it lightweights the vehicle. So here's Dewey who came up with the process. He's now with the company. Here's John Van Leeuwen who's actually on, he's on the board of, of John is of Reasons to Believe. And uh, uh, they will be at a one ton per day production by Q2 2022 and 100 tons per day production by, by a year after that. That's how fast this is scaling. Uh, how is this an energy play? Well, where does energy come from? Where's it gonna come from in 20 years? Hydrocarbons are God's gift to human beings. There's so much energy stored in a hydrocarbon. So what we do today is we combust it. You take methane, oxygen, turn it to CO2 and water. Uh, that's about 800 kilojoules per mole come spewing out of energy. Tomorrow, and in fact, both of these steps we can do today. You can take methane, strip off the hydrogens, get two moles of hydrogen and carbon solid. We're do this, is, this is using hydrocarbons with zero CO2 emission. Read my lips, zero CO2 emission from hydrocarbons. And so you, you just pull off these hydrogens. This is a process was known as furnace black since the 1950s. 90% 90 efficiency in the 1950s. They just didn't know what to do with all that carbon. Uh, Bill Gates just put in uh, money into where he's using uh, molten salts uh, to do this. And then you just use this in a fuel cell. These two combined, these two reactions combined is about 400 kilojoules per mole. So it's half the energy out. You say, well, that's only half. The oil companies are all gonna switch to this. Shell's behind this. Uh, uh, Exxon Mobil's behind this because 
efficiency on combustion is 25 to 40 percent. Efficiency here is 90 percent. Efficiency here is 80 percent. So you get it back in efficiency. This is the thermodynamics, but the real numbers that you get out of it are about the same. You get about the same energy content out with zero CO2 emission from hydrocarbon. You will never beat hydrocarbon fuel. 14-inch hole in the ground comes out enormous amounts of energy much more than you can get in wind, solar, 14 inches, and just huge amounts of energy come out. Uh, what are you gonna do if you have 30 billion tons of CO2 emitted by human beings every year, you chop off those two oxygens, what are you gonna do with your eight billion tons of carbon? Well, of course, we're gonna turn it into flash graphene. If you just say we're gonna take this and sequester it and pump it down whole, for every, mole for every atom of carbon you pump down whole, you remove two atoms of oxygen from our atmosphere. And the other thing is the compression and the cost of pumping it down whole. So where are you gonna put eight billion tons of carbon? You could put eight billion tons of graphene in cement and concrete today, 44 billion tons are produced. So there's places you could put it today if you wanted to, but it's gonna go in all sorts of composites. How's this an environmental play? Well, waste food, 30 to 40% of all food is thrown out worldwide. It has to be because it goes bad. This forms not just CO2, it also forms methane in landfills, which is a much worse greenhouse gas. Uh, plastic. Plastic waste is a huge problem worldwide. Rubber tires, the U.S. does pretty well with them. The rest of the world does not. We turn all of that into graphene. We, here's all the different plastics. Boom. Flash, flash, flash. All of these form graphene. The reason why recycled plastic costs more than virgin plastic is because of the human separation. It's separated, separated, separated. We can take the mixture of the, all the plastics together, boom, flash them, we break every carbon-carbon bond, all the non-carbon atoms come flying out and those can be trapped and you get graphene. We can turn all of this waste plastic that's a real problem for humankind into graphene. And this is, each flash is less than a second. Uh, here's some of the advantages, $35 a, a ton in plastic, uh, a ton of plastic it, it, and then we, we can use uh, $35 in electricity costs. No sorting, no pre-washing. You, you get uh, recycled plastic, it's washed three times with hot water and detergent, which is another problem in itself. Uh, it's unaffected by plasticizers, dyes, adhesive, adhesives, food waste, inorganic or organic fillers. There's no solvent, no water, no leftover ash. Uh, we took, so this, this is a little story where we took uh, 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 Ford came to us, they said they are now responsible for all of their cars in Europe. After 25 years, 30 years of use, it comes back. Here's your car back, Ford, deal with it. And they have to, they're only allowed to landfill 5%. What are they gonna do with that? Because every lightweight vehicle has 200 to 350 kilograms of plastic in it. So we got all this mixed plastic, where they strip wires, all these mixed plastics from Ford, from one of their stripper lots came to us, boom, we turned it into flash graphene. We sent it back to them. They put it in their composites, in the foam cushion seats, and they got the expected uh, noise dampening and the expected strength enhancing from this. Then they sent those composites back to us. We flashed it, turned it into graphene. So it's a beautiful cycle of what we can do. We just turn these things back into graphene and turn it into your new composites. And this is gonna, now they're gonna start substituting out aluminum, with strengthened plastics, again, light weighting the vehicle. So this is, this is more on the energy. Other projects we're looking at, uh, trying to replace concrete, which is 2,500 years old. Can we just take things that are now high in graphene content? Steel, aluminum. Uh, we're using a similar flash process now to recycle lithium ion batteries. Only 5% of lithium ion batteries are recycled. Why? Because you lose money doing it. And all of these electric vehicles, all of these batteries are gonna be coming due now for eight to 10 years. It is an utter mess. Right now we ship this problem overseas and let somebody else deal with it. But that's, that, that doesn't help the world out. So there's only 5% that are recycled. It is a mess to recycle these. If you use the hydrometallurgical method, you're using concentrated acids, 15 molar acids, lots of water, big mess. If you use the pyrometallurgical, these are big furnaces and that you have to use, huge amounts of energy. So what we found is we just flash the cathode, you take the cathode waste, you flash it, Whatever is magnetic is what you want. We get the cathode back out. It is a better cathode. We put these into batteries. It's better than the original cathode. And we know that because we build batteries. I have a battery company. This is something we, we know how to do in my group. And, uh, um, and that's because it has a conductive carbon coat over the surface that's lithium ion permeable. 
something that you have to do other steps on to, to do normally. And so you can see here that we can, here's, here's uh, uh, you, 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 you look at this sort of plot. This tells you the amount of cobalt, nickel, manganese, and lithium you can get out. We can get out almost all of it in this one flash. The lithium rides in with the cathode because it's a lithium cobalt oxide rides in with the cathode, and we don't destroy the cathode. It's so quick, the cathode itself doesn't decompose. You do this with pyrometallurgical or hydrometallurgical method, you lose completely the structure of the cathode. You have to rebuild it. Plus, with pyrometallurgical, you, you lose the lithium as well. Here we retain this. Why do we have to go to the Congo to get any more cobalt? All the risk of it. All these elements are right here. We can just pull them right back in. And so here you can, you can really look at the economics. Normally you take the battery apart and you flash it, you go to the elements or solution, you resynthesize the cathode, put it back in. We just flash it, take the cathode directly, we don't lose the structure and put it back in. Here's the bottom line, you can, you, however you want to look at this, you want to look at energy, you want to look at greenhouse gas emissions, here's what it is, we can make our net profit, and this is using the software that's been written by Argonne National Lab, where you put in all your different parameters. We'll be making over $21 per kilogram on the cathode, whereas it, right now the hydrometallurgical method would only gives $3.50, pyrometallurgical, you're losing $3, and that's just with lithium cobalt oxide. As soon as you go to the new generation batteries, it's a losing proposition on anything to recycle. So here we can make money all the way across. The other thing we've done is we've done urban mining. So we can take uh, printed circuit boards, flash them, you can get out these precious metals that you need. And uh, all the elements are here. Why don't we just keep on mining? Why don't we just learn how to grab what's already in the elements there? Uh, uh, so so uh, this is the fastest growing form of waste. It's called e-waste, electronic waste, all the devices we throw out. 8.8% increase in the waste every year. So what, we, what do we do is we just flash it and we pull out the precious metals so you can get rhodium, uh, palladium, silver, and gold out. And you get these huge amounts coming out. We add a little bit of add additive. This is CPVC pipe. This is plumber's plastic pipe. You add that to it and it makes the halogenated elements and they come out much faster. They're much more volatile. So we can pull out all of these elements. We can also uh, pull out the heavy elements from the electronic waste. We can pull out, in one flash, we can pull out enough mercury that this becomes safe for agricultural soil, the residue according to the WHO standards. Cadmium is much harder, stricter standards. Three flashes, each flash is less than one second. You can use this as agricultural soil. So you can pull out the, the heavy elements this way. Um, we, we did this uh, rare earth elements. You may have heard that rare earth elements is a huge national concern. We have to have rare earth elements in order to build our smart devices. And uh, um, so we can pull all those out too from, from uh, um, from fly ash. Fly ash is the residue that's left after coal mining. And uh, what do you do with that residue? We have mountains of it. Well, coal has rare earth elements in it, but it's dispersed in there. You burn away the carbon, you're left with, with aluminum, ox uh, aluminum, silicon oxides, aluminum oxides, and calcium oxides. But there's rare earth elements. We just flash that and we get out double the amount of rare earth elements that you can get by just using very strong acids and we just use 0.1 molar HCl. You could drink, sorry, you could drink 0.1 molar HCl and it, and it wouldn't affect you. This is how dilute we can, because what happens is it breaks this thing open and it converts them from the phosphates, which don't dissolve very well, to the oxides, and those come right out. We can pull out from bauxite residue, which is the residue from, from, or, from aluminum production. Uh, we can pull out the rare earth elements from, from e-waste. Uh, soil remediation, you just take soil. We, we had trouble getting hold of, of, of uh, uh, some of these soils from these sites, so we just took the soil from the university and we contaminated it. We know how to do that sort of thing. And uh, uh, we just flashed it and we can get all of these different metals out of the, of the contaminated soil, all the organics, we just flash those and those turn into graphene. So we go from toxic organics to non-toxic. And so in the last couple of minutes, I'll tell you how we're capturing now carbon dioxide on plastic waste. Again, we got to deal with carbon dioxide, whether we believe it's a problem or not, it has to be dealt with. And so we've learned how to take plastic waste. This is not in a flash process, it's in another process that which we'll be publishing on it very soon. And we can turn it into material that can trap CO2 from flue gas, can 
trap CO2 and convert it directly into ethylene, trap CO2 from natural gas, and direct air capture of CO2. So we can take all these different polymer types, and, and uh, this is just hidden here because we haven't yet published it, but you can trap at one bar, at one atmosphere, you can trap over 20% by weight CO2. Just by one single step, we take plastic and we treat it in a certain way. And at 0.1 bar, which is flue gas type, we can trap about 6 or 7% of, of weight percent of the CO2. And it works in even 70% humidity. You can trap this. This is just showing that, that you're trapping CO2, whereas other gases come through very rapidly. Even with the humidity here, 70% humidity, which is what a flu, flu system has. And our costs here will be about $21 per ton in capture of CO2 from flue gas. And we can release it at 75 degrees, which is a very low temperature. Generally, with liquid amines, you, they, they have to heat them up to 120 to 140 degrees centigrade. So this is, this is the bottom line. What's the economics? How much does it cost to trap the CO2? And so we, we can go through it. It's, again, these the standard programs that let you calculate this. And now, the, the final thing I'll leave you with is that if you have to take CO2 and compress it, you've lost a lot, you, you, you put in a lot of energy. So what we can do is we can take this now with an electrochemical system. We go in with carbon dioxide, 10% carbon dioxide stream in nitrogen, which is what about flu gas is, it's about 10% CO2. We stream it on in and you have a, an electrode there and a catalyst and out comes ethylene. You never have to compress the CO2. And this is just using a plastic derived layer there to, to, uh, to do this. So what this just shows is that with nanotechnology, a lot of these problems that we have can begin to be dealt with. The waste problems, the CO2 problems, there are ways to address this that are not just hypothetical anymore. They can really be done and there's companies starting around this. And so here, here's the, the ethylene production we can get. And the folks with the STARS are the ones who have done this. Uh, um, so this has been funded by the Air Force and by the Department of Energy. And Universal Matter, which has started, you go to, go to universalmatter.com. You could read a little bit about the company there. And then these will be spinoffs. Um, uh, ben is here. He's on the board uh, if you want to talk about the financial things on that. And uh, that's where we are. I'll stop for questions. Uh, this is incredibly exciting to me. Um, I have been concerned about uh, the, our dependence in China um, on what over 95% of our rare earths, uh, mature, you know, rare earths minerals that we, we use in everything, and also the the horrible problem of plastic waste. Are you are you basically? So I know you touched on these things. Are you basically saying that most of the rare earths that we need, we don't have, you know, we don't have to get from China anymore, and most of the plastic waste and electronics waste, we can recycle and, and get this graphene and put in everything? Yes. It's working. Yeah. Is this working? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. U.S. Ha has a lot of rare earth elements. We used to mine these, but you have to go very deep, and it, what comes up is radioactive water. You get uranium, thorium, the, the daughters of these. And, and, uh, and then it's a big problem to get rid of that radioactive waste. And so they shut down the rare earth element mining. And then the day we shut it down, China's price went up tenfold on rare earth elements. And they have held this as, as like for J over Japan. They said, we're not going to sell you any. So it's a real problem. It's a national security issue. But it's all around us. We're carrying around rare earth elements in our smartphones. We have all of this. We don't have to mine this anymore. We've mined enough. We can get it all. Yeah, next, next and possibly final question. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Yesterday I heard about the potential uh, risks of uh, AI and that the so-called, let's say, dirty AI requires uh, surveillance. So <clears throat> I was reading that the European Union funded two, they had a, a, a contest and the two winners received one, uh, 1 billion euros over 10 years. One of the projects was entitled The Human Brain and the other was entitled Graphene. And so that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And uh, so from what I've read, it's been reported that graphene is detectable uh, by pulse microwaves uh, from either cell towers or uh, satellites. Um, 
that are capable of, let's say, oh, a certain level of uh, megahertz of power uh, to detect uh, the presence of graphene. And it's also been reported that um, some laboratories have reported that have studied the contents of the so-called vaccine, uh, which is really a serum, uh, that the serum, uh, certain doses of the serum uh, contain graphene. So, uh, not no, I'm, I'm agnostic on this. I just, just want to report to you what I've been told. Right. So, so let, let me, um, Steve wants me out of here. So, so let, me, <laughs> let me get to your answer to this. I've done a video on my YouTube channel, DR James Tour, if you're into YouTube, DR James Tour, on, on this whole issue. I don't believe any of this stuff of graphene in the vaccine. This is a bunch of nonsense. I've looked at some of these pictures. I don't trust any of these pictures. And as far as making the, the person ferromagnetic, that is utter nonsense, utter nonsense. If I could, if I could inject a person with, with, a, with graphene and now interface with them electronically, I would have done that already. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't know how to do that. There's no science that allows you to do that. That is impossible. If you want, if, if you want to have an RFID tag, that's gonna be about one centimeter square, and that has to have a lot of embedded electronics that go with it. There's no power source on it. This thing of being able to stick metal up to your arm and it sticks after the vaccine, this is utter nonsense. <laughs> If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising, but if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible, and you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation, and there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.